Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that truly is a baffling case. The way that it happened and the reasons behind it are very questionable and they really don't make that much sense at all. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to Magic Spoon for partnering with me on today's video. Magic Spoon is a Saturday morning cartoon-inspired cereal that is both delicious and fueling. Magic Spoon offers a high-protein, keto-friendly, sugar-free, gluten-free, grain-free cereal with natural flavors. Each flavor of their cereal comes with 0 grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and 4 to 5 net grams of carbs per serving. Their variety pack comes with four delicious flavors, including fruity, frosted, cocoa, and peanut butter. I have all four flavors in the variety pack, and I've been sharing them with my roommates, and let me tell you, we are all obsessed. My favorite flavor is the cocoa flavor. I'm a sucker for anything chocolate, especially my cereals, because that chocolate cereal with milk just brings me back to my childhood. My roommate has been crushing our Magic Spoon cereal, and his favorite flavors right now are frosted and fruity. And then my other roommate, she loves the peanut butter one because she just loves anything that has to do with peanut butter. I love Magic Spoon because I personally am a vegetarian, so I really need to look for those other sources of protein throughout my day, and Magic Spoon makes it really easy to get in some protein. They taste amazing, and I love them, but Magic Spoon wants to make sure that each and every customer is happy with their order. So if you don't like it for whatever reason, they will refund your money, no questions asked. So if you want to try Magic Spoon out for yourself, make sure you scan the QR code on the screen or head to magicspoon.com slash Rachel Shannon or use code Rachel Shannon on their website to get $5 off any order. Again, make sure you use the QR code, head to the link below or use code Rachel Shannon to save $5 today. Thank you again so much to Magic Spoon for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into today's case. Mirna Salahin was born on March 30th, 1988, and she grew up in the city of Jakarta, Indonesia, and she had a twin sister named Sandy. As she grew up, she developed a love for design, and she decided to pursue a career in design. So, she decided to uproot her life in Indonesia and moved all the way to Sydney, Australia to study there. By 2007, she was admitted into the Billy Blue College. While there, she wanted to reach out to other Indonesian students to connect with and form friendships with. So, she eventually met two other students named Hani Boon and Jessica Wangso, as well as a young man named Arif Sumarko. Throughout their time at school, the four friends grew very close, they studied together, and they all formed a special bond over the four years that they attended college. Eventually, Mirna started dating Arif, but the group of four remained close. After graduating, Arif, Mirna, and Hani all returned back to Jakarta, while Jessica stayed in Sydney, hoping to become a permanent resident. Resident. She and her parents, as well as two siblings, did ultimately get citizenship in Australia, and Jessica went on to work as a graphic designer at New South Wales Ambulance. So, the three that moved back to Indonesia, they all kept pretty close contact. They tried their best to stay in touch with Jessica, but obviously that's tricky with her being so far away and not being able to see her all that often. So, they did drift apart, but they remained friends. Myrna actually hadn't seen Jessica for about three years before she decided to return back to Sydney for a visit, and while there, her and Jessica met up. The two decided to get some dinner together, and they were really excited to catch up. But things didn't really go as planned. The two just didn't seem to have the bond that they once had, and the conversation didn't really go as planned. At one point, Myrna told Jessica that she didn't really approve of Jessica's new boyfriend. In fact, she really didn't like him at all. Those close to Myrna would later say that she was the type of person who was kind of brutally honest. She would tell you exactly how she felt and she didn't really hold back. She used tough love and sometimes she could come off as a bit harsh. Most friends really appreciated this trait about her, but sometimes it didn't always sit right with others. So, her telling Jessica this naturally made Jessica really upset, 
but she got upset to the point that her and Jessica just sort of sat there in silence before Jessica angrily got up and left the restaurant, leaving Myrna there to finish her meal by herself and pay the bill by herself. We don't exactly know what Myrna said to make Jessica so upset so quickly, but those close to her think that she might have just used her brutal honesty and said something that came off as really harsh. They hadn't seen each other in a long time, and obviously Jessica should have known this trait about her beforehand, but if it's been a couple of years and you haven't really talked, that's probably how that happened with it coming off as really harsh and maybe even mean. But there also could have been other reasons for why Jessica took whatever Myrna said so personally. Jessica was always known to have a bright, goofy personality. She was outgoing and fun to be around. But during her time in Sydney after graduating, she was struggling. She was struggling with some deep, deep depression, and she used alcohol as a way to cope with it. And about a year after the meetup with Myrna, Jessica and her boyfriend did break up. By 2015, Jessica was actually hospitalized five different times after five different suicide attempts. There was also one incident where she was driving under the influence and she drove her car into a nursing home. Thankfully, nobody inside was hurt or killed, but she was literally feet away from crashing into the rooms of a resident there. As a result of the crash, she suffered two broken ribs and a chest injury. She also received multiple citations for driving under the influence. It was said that, by all accounts, after this accident, she didn't even seem to feel bad. She never expressed regret or guilt over the fact that she almost killed somebody in that nursing home. She was struggling hard, and everyone around her knew it. Because of all of these incidents and because of just how she was changing and how she was treating people, she lost her job as a graphic designer at this same time. As Jessica was dealing with some really severe mental health issues, Myrna was doing wonderful in her life. That same year, in November of 2015, Myrna and Arif went to Bali to get married. They had a beautiful wedding full of friends and family who they loved, but the one person who wasn't invited was Jessica. Arif would later say that the last interaction Myrna had with Jessica, they just weren't on the best terms. They didn't think it was the best idea to invite her since they weren't really close anymore anyways. But Jessica didn't see it that way. She was very shocked, upset, and hurt that she wasn't invited to the wedding. She saw that her life was spiraling while two of her closest friends were flourishing and they didn't even bother to invite her to their wedding after being best friends with both of them for four years. So, because of how badly she was struggling, Jessica decided that the best thing for her was to move out of Australia and back home to Indonesia. Clearly, things weren't working out in Australia, so she thought that maybe things would get better if she just returned back to her home country. Only two days after returning back to Jakarta, Jessica reached back out to Myrna. It seemed that she wanted to mend her friendship with her. She wanted them to be close again. So, she invited her to have a cup of coffee with her. Now, some reporting on this is a little bit different. I feel like some details may have been added to make it a little bit more dramatic or whatever, but some sources said that Jessica was hellbent on meeting up with Jessica alone for coffee, and they said that when Myrna was invited, she was a little bit reluctant to meet up with her alone, maybe even scared to be with her alone, not necessarily thinking that something would happen like life or death, but just thinking that things weren't going to go well again since the last time they met up just the two of them things didn't really go well. So, Myrna ended up having Hani, the other close friend of theirs, join her and Jessica for their meetup. The meetup took place on January 6, 2016, and the group decided on meeting up at 5 p.m. at the Grand Indonesia Shopping Mall to get some coffee at Cafe Olivier in the mall. But on CCTV footage, Jessica actually is seen arriving to the coffee shop at 3.30 p.m., an hour and a half before they agreed to meet up. CCTV cameras capture Jessica entering the cafe and then looking around and then leaving only a few minutes later. Then, 45 minutes later, by 4.14 p.m., Jessica returns back to the cafe, now carrying three shopping bags. Inside each shopping bag, there's a small bottle of liquid hand soap, 
Jessica would go on to say that she went to the cafe to see if her friends were there. They weren't, so she left to go get her two friends a gift. So she got them each a little bottle of hand soap. This was confirmed on CCTV footage that she did go to the store Bath and Body Works the same day to get those hand soaps and then the bags that the soaps were in, they were from Bath and Body Works. However, some say that she actually went there to look around and see where the security cameras were. So, there were two cameras in the cafe that captured the table where Jessica was sitting but one of the cameras was pretty obscured by greenery and the other had a pretty clear shot of the table. Some of the cameras captured Jessica looking around, looking up at the ceiling, and even looking directly into the security cameras. After sitting down, Jessica texts Hani and Mirna and tells them that she wants to pre-order their drinks for them so that they're ready for them before they get there. Hana and Mirna replied saying that it's no big deal that they'll just order their drinks when they get there, but Jessica insists she wants to order their drinks for them ahead of time so that they're there for them when they get there. So Jessica orders two cocktails, one for herself and one for Hani, and then she ordered a Vietnamese iced coffee for Myrna. After getting the three drinks, she sits back down and arranges the drinks and shopping bags so that the drinks are obscured from being captured on the surveillance camera by those shopping bags. When she got the drinks, it was 4.24 p.m., so it was still quite a bit before they planned to be there and even longer before the friends actually got there. Myrna and Hani finally arrived to the Olivier at 5.16 p.m. after their drinks had been sitting there for almost an hour, which to me definitely would have bothered me just a little bit. The fact that the ice would have been completely melted, it would have been watered down by that point, and if you ordered a hot drink, it would be cold by then, so there was really no reason to get those drinks so early. But regardless, as soon as she sat down, Jessica handed the two other women their drinks, and Myrna took a sip of her coffee right away. And according to Hani, as soon as Myrna drank that coffee, she could taste that something was off. On the security footage, which I will try to include if I'm able to, you can see her taking a sip of the coffee and immediately fanning her mouth and making a bit of a face as if the coffee is really nasty. You can see her shifting her weight in her chair and playing with her hair, and she even asked Hani to smell the coffee. Hani agreed that something fell off, but she didn't sip the coffee to see what it was. You know how when you have something that tastes really awful and completely not what you're expecting and you want everybody around it to try it too so that they suffer with you or they understand what you just tasted? They didn't do that. It seemed like it was so nasty that Hani didn't want to try it, and obviously... Jessica did not want to try it either. Then, within literal minutes of her taking that very small sip of coffee, Myrna leans back in her chair. She begins seizing and starts foaming at the mouth. As soon as that happens, there is chaos and panic in that cafe. People start rushing to her, and Hani immediately called Arif in a panic, and an ambulance was also called. As people were rushing to her aid and absolutely panicking, Jessica looked very confused and she looked like she had no idea what was going on, but she wasn't all that panicked. She just watched it all go down, looking confused, but not really offering any help. Then as people are trying to help Myrna, Jessica looks at the cafe manager and asked her what they put in her coffee. The manager thought that this was weird from the get-go because nobody at that point was even thinking about the coffee. Usually when a medical emergency happens like this and people are trying to figure out what happened, especially if someone is seizing, usually people would jump to epilepsy or some sort of underlying condition. No one's going to start thinking about the food or drink that they had unless they're like throwing up or choking or having an allergic reaction. Someone seizing and foaming at the mouth I'm sorry, but the first thing that most people think of is not going to be the food or drinks that they just had. They're going to think that something is neurologically wrong, like epilepsy or some similar disorder. Either way, the ambulance finally arrived and Myrna was on her way to the hospital, which was located only one mile away. But unfortunately, within five minutes of reaching the hospital, Myrna passed away. And unfortunately, because of how quickly all of this happened, Arif had been on his way to the hospital to meet his brand new wife there, but he didn't make it in time. 
he got there just as she had already passed, which is just the worst possible thing that could happen to someone in a situation like this. I'm sure the entire thing was just gut-wrenching and horrible for him. Now, because of how sudden this death was, it was obviously suspicious to everybody involved. So, shortly after her death, her body was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy to figure out what exactly caused such a random, strange, and sudden reaction. However, due to Myrna's family's religious beliefs, they only allowed the medical examiner to examine her stomach, liver, and urine. So, unfortunately, they weren't able to complete a full autopsy, which, again, is a little bit unfortunate, but they were able to gather enough information from this. Based on the autopsy, the medical examiner found bleeding within Myrna's stomach as well as 0.2 milligrams of cyanide in her stomach. So they determined that she most likely died as a result of cyanide poisoning. Like I said, everybody was suspicious following Myrna's sudden death, especially now knowing that there was cyanide in her stomach. But one of those people that were very suspicious was that cafe manager. The manager was so off-put by Jessica's comments about the coffee that she actually saved the coffee just in case there was something wrong with it. And it's a good thing that she did because investigators were able to forensically examine that coffee and they found that there were 298 milligrams of cyanide in her coffee. Of course, after her comments, her strange behaviors that day, police started looking into Jessica. Of course, in the days after her death, while they were still trying to figure out what happened, nobody thought that Jessica could have actually been involved. There wasn't really any suspicion around her until they made that connection. They reviewed that CCTV footage and they saw a clear picture of what they believed happened. So, police had their theory and they started to go around and question those who knew Jessica. They went all the way to Australia to question people that she knew, people that she worked with, etc. One woman who had been a friend of Jessica's in the past said that Jessica kind of almost seemed to have two personalities. In one breath, the friend said that Jessica was kind, happy, bubbly, and outgoing. But at the same time, there were times that she could be nasty, mean, obsessive, and very quick to anger. Then there was one coworker of Jessica's that they spoke to. This woman's name was Christy, and she had worked with Jessica at the job where she was before she was fired. Christy told the police that Jessica had made offhand comments about knowing how to kill someone with poison. She also said that at one point, Jessica had threatened to kill Christy as well. Now, what I do want to say is that the context of these comments is important. I do want to be as fair as possible because obviously just stating it the way I just stated it seems really bad. But I saw in one interview that Jessica made those comments to her coworker when she was in the hospital after a suicide attempt. And basically what Jessica said was that the people in the hospital are treating her like she tried to kill someone, basically saying that they are treating her like a criminal. And she basically said that if she wanted to kill someone, she knew how to do it and she knew the exact amount of poison to give someone and that she knew how to shoot someone. So, in this context, it does make sense for why the coworker wouldn't report what she heard. And I do want to be fair given the context. Again, it's still a very off-putting comment, but the situation does matter when she said that comment. But either way, they spoke to Jessica's boss at the same job, and he even said that Jessica had threatened to kill him at one point. People around her were not too fond of her because of these random outbursts. Her boss also described that she just overall had a nasty attitude, she was hateful, and she was not kind. It was clear that Jessica was not mentally well, and she was really scaring those around her with these bizarre comments. Again, to be fair, we don't know the exact context of the comments that were allegedly made. We know some of the context, but not all of it. But I can't say that these are normal comments that normal people would make if you're mentally well and in a good place. Then police spoke with Jessica's ex-boyfriend. I don't know if it was the same one that Myrna didn't approve of or if it was a previous ex, 
but this ex-boyfriend actually had a restraining order out against Jessica because she allegedly vandalized his car after the breakup. She apparently also threatened him and threatened to hurt herself if he didn't get back together with her. She would also incessantly call and text him and harassed him and several of his friends even after the relationship had already ended. Then in one of her suicide attempts, she apparently tried taking her own life with a small coal barbecue and when police found her, they found a bottle of whiskey and three letters next to her bed. And in those letters, Jessica basically said that her ex is to blame for her death. So clearly, she was very mentally unstable and was showing a lot of concerning obsessive behaviors. So after this further investigation, police believed that Jessica intentionally poisoned Myrna with cyanide that she slipped into her coffee. They said that she had this plan before they even arrived to the coffee shop. They said that after arriving to the coffee shop early, she scoped the place out, tried to see where, you know, the cameras were, and then left and came back ordering their drinks early. Then she sat down with the drinks at the table and sat those shopping bags down in front of the drinks on purpose so that the CCTV cameras couldn't see what she was doing. They believed that it was then, at the coffee shop, that she spiked Myrna's coffee with the cyanide. Now, I don't know if somehow the cyanide was slipped into the soaps and then, you know, transferred that way. I don't know if she brought it with her and then bought the soaps just because she needed something, anything to cover up the coffees. Honestly, I'm not 100% sure where she would have gotten that cyanide or why she bought those soaps other than to have a bag to cover what she was doing. It seems like a really random, like, aspect of this case, but at the same time, it does make sense for her to have those bags to cover what she was doing. When it comes to motive, police believed that Jessica was very jealous of Myrna's life how successful she was, how well she was doing in her life and with her new husband. She was moving on, not really wanting Jessica involved in her life, seeing as how she didn't even invite her to the wedding. Meanwhile, Jessica had no boyfriend. She had just broken up with him. She had no job. She was struggling mentally. She really didn't have anything going for her. So, because of this extreme jealousy, Jessica took it out on Myrna and murdered her. After finding what they felt was enough evidence for an arrest, Jessica was arrested on January 30th, 2016, 24 days after Myrna's death. From there, Jessica went to the courts and she pled not guilty. The trial for murder started on June 15th. This was a very, very widely publicized case in Indonesia because of how bizarre this entire thing was and also because the people involved spanned multiple continents. But in order for Australia to provide the Indonesian investigators with Jessica's past history, they said that the death penalty had to be off of the table. Indonesia does have the death penalty for murder, but because she was also an Australian citizen, it was agreed that she would not be facing the death penalty. So the prosecution in this case agreed and they were given Jessica's records. Those records are how we found out about her suicide attempts, driving under the influence, and her nasty behavior towards her coworkers and the restraining order that her ex had against her. The prosecution in the murder trial outlined Jessica's past behaviors, her mental issues, and they explained the nature of the complicated relationship that Jessica and Myrna had. As I said multiple times, Jessica was jealous of Myrna for a multitude of reasons. They explained that she meticulously planned to murder Myrna. Obviously, she had to have gotten that cyanide at some point before meeting her friends. She didn't just grab some cyanide at the cyanide store minutes before her friends got there. She had to have purchased it way earlier at some point some other time. They talked about how she got there early and ordered the drinks ahead of time for a reason. It was not in Jessica's normal behaviors to show up to events long before the group and for her to order ahead of time for the group. So there had to be a reason for why she all of a sudden wanted to do this. They talked about how she purposely used those shopping bags to hide what she was doing from the cameras. They said that the coffee she ordered her friend had cyanide in it and there was cyanide found in her stomach. It's basically an open and shut case. It's obvious that Jessica was responsible. However, the defense said that the prosecution's case is weak. There isn't enough evidence to show that Jessica is responsible. 
a lot of their arguments centered around the cyanide issue and the results of the autopsy. The defense said that the amount of cyanide required to poison someone is more than 1,000 milligrams or 1 gram. According to some research that I've done, that doesn't seem totally accurate. It's close, but it's not completely right. Now, Myrna had 0.0002 grams of cyanide in her stomach, and most sources that I saw said that as little as 0.3 grams can kill someone weighing around 160 pounds. So assuming that Myrna was a lot less than that, maybe let's say she was around 100 pounds, give or take, it would be even less than 0.3 that could kill her. So it's not quite one gram, but the amount that Myrna had was 0.0002 grams. That's significantly smaller than what most research says could kill someone. The defense also argued that cyanide would have taken multiple days after someone ingested it to kill them. Again, some of the research that I've done sort of backs this up. Most sources say that it takes several hours to a day or two for cyanide poisoning to actually kill someone. Again, Myrna died within like 10 minutes of taking that tiny sip. According to her autopsy again, she only had a very, very small amount in her stomach. But it's also important to mention that she had no traces of cyanide in her liver or her urine, which shows that she hadn't even digested a little bit of it yet. So the defense said that this means that she didn't actually die of cyanide poisoning because there wasn't enough in her system to confidently determine that that is how she died. The one thing that the prosecution also couldn't answer for was how Jessica got that cyanide. Again, as we said before, it's pretty clear that she must have gotten it from somewhere ahead of time, but they couldn't figure out exactly where she got it from. And I don't think that question has ever been answered, and I don't think it ever will be. We still have no idea where she got it. Some sources say that she could have gone to the dark web and gotten it that way somehow, she could have gotten it from like rat poison or somewhere that you get that. I haven't seen anywhere if police traced her bank history or something like that, but I'm sure they wanted to know where she got it from, so I'm sure they did trace her bank history and tried to find CCTV footage to see if they could pick her up buying it anywhere, but I don't think they were able to track down where she got it because I'm assuming that's something that they would tell us, and I'm assuming that's something that they would want to know. So I don't think anyone has ever figured out exactly where she got that cyanide from. The biggest thing that I have seen with this defense is whether or not she truly died of cyanide poisoning, because again, they just don't think that it was enough, and they don't think the time span was long enough for the cyanide to have actually killed her. But to me, I think that even if it's questionable how much she had in her system or how fast she died, being less than what is expected to be lethal, and her dying quicker than expected, the fact of the matter is that the cyanide didn't get into her system by itself and she had no prior medical issues that I know of, no underlying conditions that could explain this random seizure. There is no other plausible way that the cyanide could have gotten into her system other than her sipping that coffee, which is confirmed to have had cyanide in it. Maybe she did have some sort of condition that just made her a lot more sensitive to it or made her react quicker. Maybe she weighs a lot less than a lot of the sample sizes that we have for the research that's been done on this subject. There's a lot of things that can come together to explain why she died quicker and with a lower dose than what is expected in most people. So after several weeks of trial and arguments on both sides, the courts came to their decisions. On October 27th, 2016, Jessica Wongso was found guilty of Myrna's murder, and for this, she was given a sentence of 20 years behind bars, which to me is just not even close to enough, but it's been reported that while hearing her sentence, and honestly, throughout this entire case as a whole, Jessica remained emotionless and expressionless. The judges in this case said that even if the cyanide didn't kill Myrna outright, the cyanide caused the prolonged pain and suffering that she experienced before her death, and that was enough to say that she is a sadistic evil killer. But even though the judges thought of her as this evil person who murdered someone out of spite, 
They said that they hope she will change and become a better person. In response to the ruling, Jessica said that this case was unfair and one-sided. She maintains her innocence and since has appealed her conviction. As far as I've seen, nothing has come of that. So that is where the case sits right now. I think obviously that Jessica is guilty, but I do know that there is a bit of evidence lacking. The one thing that I am dying to know is where she got that cyanide from and whether or not she truly meant to kill Myrna or if she just wanted to make her really sick. I think with how much she put in that coffee, she probably did want to kill her because if she drank the entire coffee, she, again, would have died even though she died a lot before that, but Jessica knew if she drank the entire coffee, she would have died from that. I also don't think she knew that it had a taste to it because I didn't know that. Like, I don't know what has a taste to it and what doesn't in terms of like poisons, I guess. I don't think she knew that it had a taste to it. So I think that she planned on Myrna drinking that entire coffee without even realizing what was in it. Obviously, that's not how it worked, but she still drank enough of it for it to kill her, unfortunately. But still, again, I'm dying to know where she got it from. She had to have gotten it from somewhere and it kind of drives me crazy that they were never able to track that down. So I hope eventually we do find that out or I hope eventually Jessica tells us where she got it, but I don't think she ever will. Again, I do think that Jessica is guilty. I think the prosecution got it right in saying that Jessica was very mentally unstable. She was not well. She was very jealous of her friend and how well she was doing to the point that she wanted Myrna to feel the pain that she was feeling and decided to kill her. I think that is why all of this happened. I do think her sentence was too short. I don't think she should ever get out of prison for the simple fact that Myrna will never be able to live the rest of her life so neither should the person who killed her. But if she does ever get out, I hope there is hope for Jessica in terms of rehabilitation. But that's all I'm going to say about that and that is all I have for today's case and now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think there truly was enough evidence to convict Jessica? Do you think she'll ever be able to appeal? Do you think that Jessica really did try to kill Myrna or do you think she just wanted to hurt her? Do you think that the motive was accurate of Jessica just being really jealous of Myrna? Or do you think there's something else going on here? Let's discuss anything that you think about this case in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow and like my Facebook page as well as my Twitter and Instagram. All will be linked down below. If you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form that I have listed down below as well. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.